Being a kid in Brooklyn near the docks, I remember snowball fights, street cars, stickball, push carts, and street games like tag and ring alivio. My reading diet consisted of Nick Carter, Horatio Alger, and the fairy tales, especially Sinbad the Sailor and Alibaba and the Fools. And then I found the kings. Walking through the marble halls, catching glimpses of oneself in the gilt mirrors, we sat in the darkened theater and were transported. I crossed the Sandy Sahara with the Foreign Legion, rode in the posse with Tom Mix, and the organ made the walls shake. I forgot about math and trying to learn French. Here at the King's, I think, was where the seed took root. <laughs> Ago, and that time we used to crank. It was an old Edison machine. We used to crank hard with bigger films, only five minutes. And the first job I had it was on the Crystal Hall on 14th Street, New York. It was a five-minute pictures. That time. After that, we started to have a book and different kind of machine, like a power machine. They still you have to crank with a small boot, no air, and just hard work. A little later, we started with the sun, and we had the record and films. But many times, the needle jumped off the record, and boy, that was hell. We had to take off the drill from the machine and rewind again and start all over again. Well, after that, we started to have a sun and the films, new equipment, and that it was very nice to work. I worked on plenty of theaters in my time. I opened the Coronet Theater on 59th Street. I, uh, I work on the Astro in New York and many, many theaters. And the last job, it was in the King. I work here five years. And it was the best year of my life. To see this theater. To start to see me close. I used to come over here in my time off when they used to have a vaudeville. And it was the best time to close this theater. That's something that anybody can feel. Well, I retired when I was 89 years old, and this was my last job, because when I heard this theater be closed, I couldn't work anymore. When Lois King's was built, the motion picture industry was in full bloom. The studios turned out hundreds of films a year. Each small city in the United States had its picture palace or palaces, every one of them built in busy residential or commercial parts of town, as the King's was in the geographical center of Brooklyn. Rap and Rap, the great Chicago architectural firm which designed the King's, did not foresee that their theaters could close. They thought they were built to last forever. It opened its doors on Flatbush Avenue just in time, shortly before the stock market crash of 1929. 
Had it been planned for a little bit later, it might never have opened because of the depression. Going to the lavish kings was the next best thing to going to the city, and for several years its films were accompanied by stage shows and vaudeville acts imported directly from the capital on Broadway. The Kings was decorated by Harold W. Rambush, whose firm also specialized in the decoration of churches. It's a wonderful experience to come here to the King's Theater, which I have not visited during the last 50 years when I actually worked on it. To enter these lobbies that are so lush and rich in their expense and in their concept of design. Here we have two enormous foyers and lobbies that are rich, if not richer than the theater itself, because in those days the theaters were so popular and so well attended that people spent a great deal of time online waiting to get into them. During that wait, they felt that they were part owners. They owned the place. It was theirs for the hours for which they had paid their money. And we wonder really how these owners and operators and producers of movies who built the theaters, why they made them so rich. Because they had, whether knowingly or unknowingly, realized that besides showing a picture and entertaining the people, they wanted to give them a lift, give them a sense of their own importance. The public who came into these theaters were for a short time, for the hours they were here, they felt like kings or barons or wealthy people. And so we see these decorations, this architecture, which was reminiscent or copied from the barons and the counts of the Renaissance. So we find in lighting, in mirrors, in murals, in architectural elaboration, it was largely on the Renaissance that this was built because in early ages, big architecture had been in temples and courts and basilicas and monasteries. Only with the Renaissance did we feel a complete change of the social system of the world where it was governed by these local potentates who made their image and created it largely by their architecture. So we find gold and relief ornament. Of course, it's a fake because these palaces were done in marble and wood, rarely in stucco. Here, it was all done with plaster ornamentation.
I would say that a real historian or architectural expert would feel that this was really bastardizing architecture because it was not correct according to any style. Every effort was just made to make it as voluptuous, as gorgeous as possible. restraint of any kind was put on it. If an effect could be attained in some more or less legitimate historical manner, it was used because it was purely show business. Tracy, your street singer. to be back in this King's Theater again, singing on its stage. Brings back the orchestra, the conductor, beautiful audiences. Besides the piano and my violin, there were 25 other musicians at the opening of the King's Theater. The orchestra was conducted by David Pazansky. It was a gala affair that opening week when we played for the opening movie in which Dolores Del Rio was a star. We also played a couple of overtures and accompanied several other famous, then famous actors and actresses who appeared at the opening. Vaudeville began years and years ago with such big names as Eddie Leonard, Eddie Foy and the Seven Foys, Julius Tannen, and as the people came, the theaters grew. You had people like Al Jolson come in, Eddie Cantor, Schnauzer Durante. The theaters turned into big palaces, palaces all over the city and in the hinterland, in the suburbs. And it was a great pleasure to come into a theater like King's 
and every visit to find the same people, the same faces sitting in the same seats. For most of us, that is kids of my age, my generation, our parents came over from the old country, very poor. Rarely did they get into a palace as gorgeous as this. And rarely would they ever have dreamt that their children would, every Saturday, come into their own palace, place themselves, and for three hours, behold magic. I'm standing in the middle of the organ lift here at Lowe's King's Theater. The organ lift is the only thing that is left of the instrument. The organ which was here was known as a wonder more because these theaters were wonder theaters and as you can see they really were wonderful. The organ was installed in 1929 about the time that the silent film era was ending. They were certainly the, one of the most intricate things that you can imagine. They were built specifically, of course, to accompany silent films. But since the silent film era was over, they were, of course, used for various other things. You couldn't believe the things that, that we were required to play. The popular music of the day, Tchaikovsky, Bach, whatever there was, that's what we had to do. You have to understand that this was the depression and where else for 10 cents could you be transported from the slums of East New York and Brownsville where one street looked like another, where people weren't working and you suddenly came into this magnificent edifice and you saw a film that had to do with Nice or the Riviera or the Casbah. Even in a gilded dream palace, you are often jolted back for a few minutes to the harsh realities of the world outside. Well-known personalities made pitches for worthy causes. The March of Dimes, the Will Rogers Fund, the unemployed. If you could afford the price of admission, then you were expected to shell out a few cents for those who could not. And in these cathedrals to the motion picture, the ushers took up the collection for these secular causes as if you were in church. Of unemployed men and women today are struggling to keep their homes and families together. Won't you help them by sharing your better fortune with them? Remember, sharing does not hurt like suffering. You got a horn of plenty at the movies in those days. You got Gable and Colbert in It Happened One Night, William Powell and Myrna Loy in The Thin Man. 
As a second or B picture, you might get Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and their horses. Stormy day, wild seas lash the coast of New Jersey. Watery devastation of buildings and bungalows. The storm gods are angry. All over the continent, the elements have been playing... And you've got FDR, a great star at the Low East Kings. The only president held over by popular demand on the screen of the newsreels for four terms. It's a dangerous thing for their unfortunate peoples. The Academy Awards. Hitchcock. Jimmy Stewart. Thank you very much, sir. The great thrill... And with the double features and the newsreels, you've got a cartoon and travel talk and kiddies matinees on Saturday with cereals. Not just Ginger Rogers, but Buck Rogers, and Flash Gordon. And on other days, turkey raffles and dish night. Mama could have a set of 52 dishes at the end of the year if she came every week, and she did. And the home team, the bums, the Dodgers at Ebbets Field, forever playing the Yankees. Going to the movies was a different ball game than it is today, when you only get a single feature, no gorgeous lobby to wait in if it's raining. And nowadays, it's one movie and you're back out on the street again. I defy anyone of today's children to have that same type of emotion or feeling that we had of coming into a theater, which was in those days a theater, not a movie house. There was no TV. There was no competition. It cost you a dime and you waited patiently from week to week until you could come into something like this. This place had such an effect on me, this Lowe's Kings. I think I was 14, and I had started to go with girls, and this was my first date. I was living in Long Island, and I went to Sheepshead Bay to visit my, my cousin Sharon. And we were walking around, and this really cute guy came over and talked to us. And I was about 15, she was about 12, so right away I had the advantage. And he asked me out for that weekend. It was a Saturday night at the movies. So I said, fine, and I went. And we got to the theater, and it was, it was really, you know, it was really overwhelming. It was so beautiful and big inside, and he was so pleased with himself. I mean, it was like the two of us were going to the Roxy, you know? <laughs> like something really terrific. So we got inside, and I didn't know where we were going to sit. But he was, he, you know, it was the 50s. He was a chain smoker, so there was no question we had to go to the balcony. I would say that all my contemporaries, 10 years older, 10, 15 years younger, in coming to movies like this, was introduced to sex in the second balconies of theaters. You took the girl out, you brought her here, you had paid, you watched the film, and after about 15 minutes, you tried to cover both of yourselves with a blanket, and you started to maul her but always one eye on the usher that he shouldn't catch you, that you shouldn't get a flashlight right on top of you. I realize it's not very romantic, but that's the way it started. Well, when he got done smoking, he started working on me. I got a little upset, and, and this guy's hands, you know, like going all up. I, I get let out with such a scream. I mean, you couldn't believe it. it. It, like, resounded in the place. It was, like, overwhelming. Everybody was like... Looking at us, I said, I want to get out of here. And he said, OK, OK, let's, let's go. I mean, it must have been a good picture, but I don't remember what it was. We got outside, and we looked across the street. He said, I, I want to make it up to you. I, I want to take you out for a soda or something. Calm down. So we looked across the street around here somewhere, and there was this little shop. He said, no, I'm going to take you to Schraff's. I mean, this was really terrific, right? This is the highlight of my life, Schraff's. I traced back. Psychologically, I even remember the film I went to see. It was 1940, and it was a, a film called Second Chorus with Fred Astaire and Paulette Goddard.
Charles, look at this. Look at this King's Theater, what happened to it. Oh, it's cold. It feels like it's, like it's dead. Brooklyn's finest showplace. First run hits, it sure, sure was. Sad to see it not in operation. Everything about it is so magnificent. I used to feel like uh, I was coming to work in a palace. I just lived here. I loved it. Look at these chandeliers. What happened to the chandeliers? Good heavens, you never saw one, not one light ever was out on these chandeliers. They were always serviced all the time. It's sad for me to see it. Yes, it's worth without a, a lot of people walking through the aisles here in the lobby. When it was open, it was so alive. This avenue was alive. The lights lit up the whole avenue. It, it lightened the stores up. People came down here not only to go to the theater, but it also brought business to the stores. You see, I'm here already for a number of years while the Lowell's King's Theater was open. We're never able to close before 3 o'clock in the morning. People first used to come out 3 o'clock from the late, late show. We're always thousands and thousands of people. During the day, at night, in the evenings, all the time. And since they closed, it's like quiet in the street. No lights are on. We're missing the lights. We're missing the graduations it used to be for the children here. Yeah, I remember a few years back, the Louis King's Theater, I graduated there. And I know a lot of people, uh, all my friends, my family, everybody graduated there. And uh, every year since since then, there's been uh, been a lot of crowds outside for graduation, like in the end of June. And um, the past couple of years, it just, you know, it's been like, uh, ever since it closed up, it's been dead over here now. We had a manager here, which I knew personally. Her name was Miss Pensica. And she invited many movie stars, like Betty Davis, uh, Joan Crawford, Jack Webb, Cesar Romero, Connie Francis, Connie Stevens. And when they came, the avenue was lit up and the cars that loaded the streets up, they were double parked, triple parked, and people from all walks came here to see the movie stars. You think that you were in California where they're having uh, the Academy Awards. It was such a beautiful sight. I sometimes I wonder if I ever should have retired. I really feel that I, ab I abandoned the ship. I, I feel terrible about it. I, I would never have let it been so neglected. It looks absolutely terrible. You remember what we used to have here? Oh, those tables lamps. and the lamps and the statues here. This was like an art gallery. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. Oh, I don't believe it. How could anybody be so cruel? This office was like a little dollhouse. I had trophies all over it, awards. The couch was here, and the patrons, I'd invite them into this office to sit down and talk to me. Everybody that came into this theater was like a guest in my home. And we had a very, very wonderful staff. Everybody worked here like a family. First of all, you couldn't help but love working in the theater. And when the manager loves the theater and tells them how beautiful everything is and treats them as though they were her own family, they, in turn, do the same thing. So everybody pitched in here, and everybody did an excellent job. I, you know, I'd come up to the theater, and I'd never take a rush into the theater. I'd always wait outside when I came to work, just so that one could tip off the other. They would never do anything wrong, but you know, they always wanted to please me so much that they said, oh, Mrs. Panzer is on her way in, and they'd get the place and they'd stand up for attention. 
they didn't have to really because they didn't do anything wrong. I knew that they didn't. But I wanted them to feel that when I walked in, I knew that everything was in good condition. Oh, and Mom, what's memories? We used to pop our own corn every morning before starting. But when the corn keep popping, the smell was so great that even in the midst of the movie, the folks would come out to buy popcorn. We only had Coke and orange. But they got tired of it, and our stand manager, Seal, had the bright idea of mixing Coke and orange and call it orange Coke. That's right. And that used to sell a lot. Then our candies, we arranged them according to colors. The higher prices on top, second eyes and third color. Raisinet, Hoovers, Snow Caps, Reese's, Chocolate Almonds, Jordan Almonds. We'd have a long line, and you'd have like the Jewish and the Muslim people coming. They ask for a candy, they have to read all the ingredients to find out if it's kosher because they can't eat it. Then they don't want that. The ice cream, the same thing. So after a time, we started selling only kosher ice cream and most unkosher snacks. I took care of the children, and sometimes were very nice, and sometimes were very bad. So in order to keep them happy, and keep them, in, you know, uh, satisfied with where they're sitting, I had to break up the children's section into grasshoppers for children under 12, and, when I, and the seniors and the juniors and all that, and every kid felt so important. They said, oh, I'm going to the grasshopper section. I didn't care where they sat in that, in that particular area because it was near an exit door and they were safe. But the fact that they were put into different sections made, made them feel that they had a little authority here. Some of them would buy one ticket and come in and open the side doors and let five or six sneak in. Then they'll get here. Four would order something. When you put the stuff on the stand, two would run away with it and say, you didn't give me anything, so I can't pay for it. I don't have the frag. So one day I caught one that always did that. So I put the frag over there, hand him the candy, everything together. He said, oh, I don't have enough money to pay for that. So I said, you wanted to run away the frag again. He just smiled and said, oh, you remember me? They were very good children until they started to buy the popcorn. Then when they bought the popcorn, they didn't eat it. They threw it at one another, and they also threw it at the girls. They teased the girls and pulled their hair. And sometimes we had a plain policeman in the audience, which I knew, and they'd show me their badge. So I would tell the children, if you don't behave, we'll get the cops over here to put you out. They were little devils. In the eight years I've worked here as an usher, uh, I got to learn a lot about the movie business and uh, how the Kings ran the movie business. Um, it's not that the theater wasn't kept well. It really was kept well. Like, um, like this, this uniform. This, we always made sure we had good uniforms and uh, everything was really kept well. Brass was always shined. Uh, theater was kept well. Even the prints were always made sure that they were checked, that they were clear and crisp. Every employee before he went on the floor had to make sure that he wore, or she wore a name plate. The uniform had to be clean. Of course, we used to have, have their uniforms cleaned every two weeks, but their uniforms had to be cleaned. Their shoes had to be polished at all times. They had to wear a tie. Their fingernails had to be clean. And Every employee looked like a, a little dream boat. I used to call them, are my dream boats ready? And they used to come out on the floor ready for, ready for action. And they felt so great walking up and down those aisles. But that couldn't help. It couldn't help it because the movies that Hollywood was making, okay, could not fill a 4,000, 3,000 seat house such as the King's I mean, like, look inside. Just there alone is 2,000 seats. The new theater's coming out now, only got about 700 seats, and they don't fill them up that often. 
that's that's what really made it the to die uh, films like uh well we had films here what well, variety of kung fu films that uh were really dead films and uh films like uh, creeping flesh things that you'd see down on 42nd street and would play to 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 houses that wouldn't cater to family entertainment one night some movie not very hot was showing so Paul went into the manager and told her that only one person was in the theater. And I said to him, gee, you know, I said, you're the only person here, whatever. Everybody would like to go home. He goes, no, I paid my money. And we had to all sit there and wait until, uh, you know, he went home. And he sat in the theater with his legs up like a king. Uh, we had gone with the wind here. We had uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, but we would pass by when uh, Jaws came. We would pass by when Star Wars came. Uh, Why would you pass by? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because the company just felt that this theater was too much to uh, upkeep. You know, like, like uh, it cost almost $1,000 a month in electric bills. Yeah. I don't know how many thousands of gallons of oil had to keep the heat this place. And then the continent's maintenance and all this. This is like a gigantic palace. This is like a regular palace. You can look around with the brass, with the, you know, the variety of crystal. And it has to be maintained. And, I mean, the plumbing and everything. And that's what, you know, when you have that kind of cost and you're not getting that much budget. Like, I'll tell you, the neighborhood was also changing. Uh, uh, Flatbush Avenue was changing a lot. A lot of stores were folding up. Uh, people weren't coming in often. We even had one time a mugging here. Where there was only four people in the audience. Uh, two got bored and I guess decided to mug the third. Several theaters near the Kings have closed and are up for sale. The product just isn't there to fill the theaters with new pictures every week. The Kings could easily join the list of movie palaces already demolished or filled with sterile cubby holes which destroyed the architect's design. B pictures have been replaced by TV movies of the week. The movie business is now dependent on a few blockbusters. The proof that the public still is magnetized by the types of magnificent decor once supplied by Rambush has been evident in many cities where great old theaters have been saved and are now used as performing arts centers. I've lived in the neighborhood for uh, approximately 50 years and I've seen many changes take place. And one of the things that really hurt was to see these beautiful theaters closing, particularly the Kings, which uh, even today, uh, I believe, inside is uh, the palace that it was when they first opened it. And there's no question that the community suffered as a result of it, that uh, the type of businesses, in many cases, that uh, we were able to uh, use before, haberdashers, ladies' specialty shops, uh, were forced to move out because the activity just didn't exist. When that marquee uh, stopped lighting up at night, Flatbush Avenue took on a completely different uh, atmosphere. Uh, however, it's uh, my very, very strong feeling that we can make changes and revitalize the community, uh, give it a real viability to the people in the area, but that is going to be dependent almost completely upon the people who live here. I didn't see so much about the deterioration of the neighborhood because I was always in here and always doing a lot of publicity work and I was too busy to really take notice. But I would hear about the other theaters and I'd see what was happening with the holdups there and people being afraid to come out to, in the evening. And I knew that one day something, the theater may have to close. It's just impossible. To, to keep it up. And I, I would be brokenhearted to be the manager of the theater here that was closing up. It, it would just tear me apart. So, one day I just awakened, went up to the home office. I didn't say anything to my husband. I said, well, I'll see what happens if I have the guts to go through with this thing. I went up to the home office to see the president of the company. And uh, I just burst into tears, and I was so glad that he wasn't there because I hate to have him see me crying. He always knew me as a bubbling uh, worker, and I, I always did everything to please. And, and uh, he, he was very appreciative of it. I'm very nice. Everybody at the office treated me beautifully. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I said, well, 
the, the next place I should go to is the uh, Mr. Meyerson, who also was a marvelous man. He's president of the company, corporation now. And I said, I, I'll tell Mr. Meyerson that I'm, I'm retiring. And uh, thank God I was lucky. Mr. Morrison was not in that day. It seemed everybody was out of town. And I was. I said to the secretary, I'm, I came to see Mr. Morrison to tell him that I'm retiring. And he wasn't there. And I said, oh, thank goodness, imagine him seeing me like this. And I then went to Mr. Diamond's office, who was the general manager. And lo and behold, he wasn't there either. <laughs> and I said, I'm lucky today. Well, I told his secretary that I was going to resign, rather retire, and uh, I left the building. When I left the building at 666 Fifth Avenue, I, I, was, I was stunned. I said, gee, did I, have a, did I do what I did? What am I going to do now? I told him I'm resigning. I, I went to every office. I, 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 just have to re I just have to retire now. And I walked. I walked for blocks, and I just didn't know whether I was doing the right thing or not. Well... Did you do the right thing? Yes. I saw this place slowly dying. I saw it die two deaths. The first time when Lowe's closed it, uh, and then the second time when this new company bought it, and they closed it. And that company lost their shirt so much that they just locked the key and walked away, and the theater just sat here, unarmed, unguard you know, unguarded. Um, Nothing put across it, no guards, no nothing. At least Lowe's put people in there to take care of it. But when these news people took over and they folded up, they didn't take care of it. And pretty soon people realized that uh, this place was, was closed. They went in there, they ripped down the screen. Kids got at the piano, shoved that over. Um, all the speakers that were sitting around here hooked up for stereo, all gone, all taken apart. Uh, the mirrors busted, things that are irreplaceable. Things that you can't buy anymore because of the cost and everything. Nobody could believe we were going to close. They started closing about three times. Every time, nobody bought. Everybody was happy. The final day, everybody was so sad. It was really hard because they thought they were going to tear it down to make a church. Then it was a supermarket. Then it was everything you can think of. So everybody was really very sad. Then they reopened, and we thought this was it. No such luck. As a kid, you know, my mother always used to come into the bedroom and say, Eli, it's time to eat. My bed was the Sahara Desert. I was always wounded in the arm. I always had a towel on my head as a kippy. Can't you see I'm bleeding, I'd say? Get up and eat, she'd say. Listen, remember how in the movies they used to turn the film and run it backwards so that the diver seemed to leap out of the water back onto the diving board? Remember that? Remember how... A a chimney steeple that was wrecked, crashed to the ground, run the film backwards, and there it was, standing perfect again. Well, that's what we can do with a lot of these old theaters. The Lois Kings can once again be a place for kings and kids, a show place, a place where you can go on dreaming, and you can get back on the horse and ride in the posse with Tom Mix. You can go across the Sahara Desert with a foreign legion, and you can forget all your schoolwork. 